How is everyone? Thank you for coming back. I hope you're well. Um, please make note of the um, announcement from Mary Todd in the um, chat that uh, you should be able to look down and um, see a place where you can choose what language that you hear that in. Um, please, everyone choose English, unless that is not uh, your native tongue and you have an interpreter. This allows uh, any time that we're talking interpretation to be happening, but that means you have to, you have to choose uh, English as your language. All right. What was yesterday's quotation about dealing with heavy emotions? Um, it may have, oh, that uh, Mark, that quote was from Dr. Katie Cannon. Um, and that quote is about art uh, and the work of justice, that the work of justice weighs heavy on the soul. Uh, but, and therefore we need art that keeps our spirits buoyant and keep us remembering our humanity and God's work in the midst of us. So that's, that's what that is. That's why there's such a really marvelous um, uh, body of work about uh, social justice and art um, and, and theopoetics actually, which was a new word for me this year. I got very excited about it. I, you know, I don't have a lick of talent when it comes to creating theopoetics, but oh, I love to, to find it and experience it. Um, and yes, indeed, she does. Uh, can I share that information in the chat? Yes, let me make a note of that. Um, and by information, Mary, do you mean that quote? I can't see you, Mary, so you gotta either un unmute. Yes, and any link, okay? Quote on art um, and any link will do. I absolutely can do that. Um, all right. How do we access yesterday's recording? Uh, the amazing Mary Todd Peters has that. Um, and Mary Todd, can you put that link in the chat? Yes, I will do that. Um, give okay. me a minute. And if you know someone who wasn't here and who wants a copy of it or who can't be here today because we are recording today as well, um, then either you either share the link from yesterday or have them reach out to Mary Todd or to me. Um, I'm going to put my uh, email in the chat so that you have access to it. My understanding is when they wrote to me about um, participating in the endowment, they had the wrong email. So they had my old PC email, which no longer works. Okay, rdavis at upsim.edu. That's my email. Um, and feel free to hang on to that if you want to continue the conversation after um, after we're officially finished uh, here with, um, with Ashley in these workshops. You know how to get a hold of me. And there are plenty of people around who know how to get a hold of me. Lord, get into the workshop, will you? Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna remind everyone to please um, mute yourself when you're not uh, uh, having conversation with other folks in the um, in the workshop. So I thought we would begin today. Yes, Robert, what can I help you with? Says Robert had a question. He's trying. He's trying to unmute. Okay. Okay. 
uh, Robert, if you get unmuted, um, then and have a question, either put it in the chat or um, just go ahead and let us know. All right. So I, um, what I want to begin today with, uh, with is a, a liturgy of lament um, to kind of just bridge between where we were today, yesterday, and where we are today. This is from the amazing. Um, uh, Presbyterian Women's Bible Study that's out this year, uh, by authored by Lynn Miller. Just and if you didn't know, if that amazing art that's in the Bible Study, she also did. So she's the author and the artist uh, for that Bible Study. So here is what we're going to do, and um, you are going to read the um, the the non-italicized, the things that are bigger uh, in, in the print. And so what I'm gonna do is ask for you to go ahead and mute yourself, except for Mary Todd, who will be our designated liturgist. And, um, but, but don't just sit there, uh, even though you don't have your, um, your audio on, please um, feel free to participate. You, O oh God, are the one who can help. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me? I cry to you, O oh God. For you are the one who can help. How can we sing your song in a strange land, O oh God? We cry to you, O oh God. For you are the one who can help. Rachel weeps for her children because they are no more. Women cry to you, O oh God. For you are the one who can help. Lord, if you had been here, our friend would not have, you messed me up. <laughs> would, would not have died. Thank you. That's all right. We cry to you, O oh God, for you are the one who can help. Let the day perish on which I was born. I am not at ease. I have no rest. I cry to you, O oh God. For you are the one who can help. We weep over our cities, wishing they knew the things that make for peace. We cry to you, O oh God. For you are the one who can help. Creation waits and groans in bondage waiting to obtain the freedom of the children of God. We cry to you, O oh God. For you are the one who can help. God says, my people are bent on turning away from me, but how can I give them up? I cry to you, my children. For we are the ones who can help. But one day God will dwell with us and wipe every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And on that day, we shall say, this is our God. We have waited and God has saved us. Our hope is in God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we hear those words of lament again. And to God, we look for help. And we are reminded so very clearly in Psalm 23. And Mary Todd, would you mind reading that? Let us listen with the ears of the freshly lamented. Um, yeah. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, 
and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <clears throat> so as we're thinking about uh, the transition from laments uh, to, to calm, we think about how do we get from laments to reassurance, to be reminded of what Pat Miller says, that uh, memory, story and memory remind us of who we are, remind us of God, who God is, and that if God was there in years and, ex and circumstance past, so God too will be with us now. And Psalm 23 reminds us very much, rehearses those stories. Even though we walk through the valley of the pandemic, God is with uh. us. So let us think about for a little bit, what is trauma? So I'm going to ask you to put it in the chat. If you had to define trauma, what words would you use? So go ahead and light up the chat. Let me hear. Hurt, overwhelming pain. Yes. Violation, uncertainty, distress, sudden life-changing, enduring pain. Yes destruction. These are guests, disorienting, disorientation, no agency. Excellent, excellent insights. Yes, good, good. So um, a lot of different places have a lot of things to say about trauma. Uh, we're going to look at a quick definition of trauma. Uh, and I want you to, I'm going to read it. Um, but I want you to listen for the things that uh, either um, surprised you or reaffirmed what you thought. So uh, you're going to put an S colon uh, under, as you type your chat. So if it's a surprise, S colon, and then that which surprised you. Uh, and... Uh, an R colon for reaffirm in the chat. So trauma, trauma is not an event itself, but the body's protective response to an event or a series of events that is experienced as harmful or life-threatening. It can have lasting Sorry, dog just came here. Oh, no, 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 sorry, look at there. My Dean was like, I was so happy to hear that you had a, uh, a snafu with, with, oh. your, uh, with your technology yesterday. So it can have a lasting emotional and physical effects on an individual. Importantly, trauma is not experienced the same by everyone. A traumatic event for one individual may or may not prompt a trauma response in another, even if the experiences appear similar. Each individual's response is unique. So, surprise that it is a uh, that's a defense mechanism. It's I know we tend to think of trauma as an actual physical or manifested or embodied experience um, when in fact it is really the body's response. Um, and the reason we talk about something as traumatic is that it is how it makes us feel in the core of our being. So, Trauma, I, many of you are showing, saying here that it, it's individual response. Um, we have lots of folks who will say things like, well, I grew up poor and it didn't, you know, cause me to make poor choices. Or uh, what's wrong with, with that person? They knew right from wrong. And we begin to see, uh, and we become, um, we become 
less filled with grace, less filled with grace. When we think in terms of that person's response ought to be the same as my response. We slide over into that judgmental. Um, and especially when we begin to think in terms of universalities or what we tended to call mega, meta narratives uh, as we you know, kind of look at the difference between modern modernity and post-modernity. Uh, one of the big key things is to understand that there used to be a time and not so distant past. And with some folks, you will hear this uh, in the halls of your churches. You will hear this in Zoom session meetings when somebody will say, it, speak in terms of universalities. Well, I don't know why they can't do this. I did this. I don't know why that's hurtful or bothersome. Can't they just pull themselves up by their bootstraps? Can't they just take personal responsibility? And that's the kind of thinking that happens when we get into um, kind of mono thinking, when we, be, when we are not thinking in terms of systems. And when we were thinking in terms of my personal experience is the same and should be applied to everybody else's personal experience. So we're gonna get out of that. But I thought it might be helpful if we took a couple of moments to look at, um, to look at the, what happens in the brain. Um, some of you who know me know that I uh, really am fascinated by brain research. Um, I can tell you who that would surprise. That would be all of my science teachers. Uh, in all of my educational endeavors. But I want you to pay attention. Do you see where it says underactive, that gray, the kind of oval looking gray shaded area? That's the prefrontal cortex. That's where our highest level of thinking happens. Yes, we know from brain research that that is the last uh, part of the brain to fully develop and that it is not fully developed in um, females until about 25 and males somewhere between 25 and 30. I can hear you laughing. Um, and yes, that's what's happening when you send your college student off, your young adult, emerging adult off to college to the professors and then you wonder why they make less than uh, wise decisions. It's because that prefrontal cortex is um, where all of that happens. So uh, making good decisions. Um, so that becomes underactive in response to trauma or when trauma is happening. That slows down, that calms down, uh, that is uh, underactive, the underactive where we are, are able to self-regulate the things that keep us from saying everything that pops into our minds. Um, and you know, the reason why we're really tired at night is because we've been editing ourselves all day long. That becomes underactive. What becomes overactive is the amygdala. And the amygdala, if you're thinking in terms of kind of High, it, we start out, uh, the amygdala is right there kind of in the back. Um, some of the systems theory folks talk, talk about that as the bird brain uh, or the reptilian or the fight or flight. Um, so that's the piece that begins to, to get overactive. I want you to look just to the right of that where you see the memory center the hippocampus. Notice that that becomes underactive. Theologically, I think that is significant because if it is indeed the memory of what God has done in years gone by and with God's people and all the, uh, uh, yeah, all of our issues, no, no, no. then um, I would say that we need to think about um, how we're thinking about memory. If memory is what gives us hope, if memory is what helps us get out of 
that panic, out of lament, out of the world is coming to an end. How do we help our people remember? How do we reinvigorate that aspect of that memory center? Fascinating things we have here. So you can see here's a couple of others. I am particularly um, uh, taken by the learning brain and the survival brain. Yeah, do with anything. The survival brain is that which is um, that which is lit up. But it's also, it's not just what's lit up in our students, it's what's lit up in us. So if we're not acknowledging uh, the trauma that's happening in our own lives and we can't escape it, uh, even those who are introverted and have quite, and frank, quite frankly enjoyed having some time that they weren't on airplanes or out uh, running around uh, even those who enjoyed some self uh, social distancing are experiencing trauma. And so we tend to be less able to think creatively, uh, much less our students. So this is, a, um, this is from the CDC actually. And here are six things. So I want you to see, I want you to see how it goes from uh, how we look and see what, what science sends to us. And then how does that begin to translate into the classrooms, into the ways in which we do Christian education? Safety is first. You've got to create a safe environment. Building a relationship so that you have a sense of, of trustworthiness, uh, this, this idea of transparency. You're not going it alone with peer support. There is a sense of collaboration, empowerment, and a respect of our cultural, historical, and gender issues and concerns. So I, um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is, is um, how do we create learning environments that take trauma into account? The first thing that we have to take into account is both this welcoming and the safety place. That, and some of us may think, well, what does that have to do with Christian education? Why are we worried about that? That just seems ridiculous. When in fact, what's going on is we're creating the space so that the spirit can work to open us to new possibilities and to deepen and nurture faith. It has to be an inclusive, so we have to pay attention not only to our language, but to the images that we're using and the way in which we talk uh, that invites folks. We're paying attention to equitable power dynamics. So is the teacher the person who's always saying what's going to happen? Are we able to create a space in which students can have some power? into how they are making choices about what they do. Bell Hooks calls this a democratic classroom. We don't tend to think about democratic classrooms. What we tend to think about is, oh, in a classroom, you learn about democracy. But how many of us have experienced um, educational settings where the power completely resided in the teacher and even ideas and even um, even your opinions and your thoughts were not as valued as the perceived uh, notes that were written on a yellowed and dog-eared piece of legal paper from which they are lecturing. But, you know, Hooks talks about recognizing that students are, uh, students have this, have wisdom in the same ways that the teachers have wisdom and that we must, um, we must create a teaching and learning environment where that wisdom that comes from life experience is as valued as the wisdom that comes from, uh, from books. Now, I am not advocating uh, at all that we, uh, 
that we just throw out books and we throw out uh, intellect. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is how do you create the space where someone can wrestle with what their experience is in conversation with what was happening in, uh, in the text. Um, and those of you who are youth leaders, um, youth directors and youth pastors and youth ministers um, know this, been doing it for years, establishing normative behaviors for the group that you're in. It's children's ministry that we have not done it as um, consistently and reliably as our uh, youth leaders have in that giving everybody who's present an opportunity to um, an opportunity to uh, say how they want class to to feel like and to experience and that way we begin to name what we want uh, a class to feel like and how we want folks to engage and then we can also hold one another accountable. Um, I need to see your faces. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. I have no idea if you all have like nodded off. Uh, there's absolutely nothing going on in the chat. And so I need to see. Um, so give me some quick feedback. Uh, you can do that in chat. Um, what about this makes sense? And what about this doesn't make any sense? Give me some chat. Hit me back with the chat. Creating safe space. Oh, yes. Actually, Bell Hooks and Parker Palmer and, and uh, Paulo Freire, all of the same kind of ilk. And um, Hooks and Freire, uh, very much so. So um, one, of my, one of the questions that I get, um, so many kids are struggling. That is so true. Um, one of the questions I get so often is, what are you reading? What are you reading in Christian education? What books are you reading? And I will tell you, it is rare for me to read a Christian education book that hasn't been, there are many Christian education books that I revisit. We're not publishing like we did at one point. Um, we're just not, I don't, and I don't know if it's that we're not, uh, we're not writing it or we're just not, it's not getting published. But, you know, every time I go to teach curriculum, I think, okay, I've got to use Maria Harris, Fashion Me a People. And then I think, um, should there be something else newer than that? Um, and then I think, well, you know, the Bible's not all that new and it still has great relevancy. Calvin's not all that new and he still has great relevancy. Where I find myself going is to the general area of education. I go to the bell hooks. I'm going to, I mean, my right now in this related to trauma, I'm reading a lot of Serene Jones, Trauma Plus Grace. Um, and she is a theologian, a public theologian. She's the president of Union New York. Um, uh, she resides in this marvelous place between, um, between ethics and theology. Uh, theology and then ethics as applied theology or um, uh, as Dr. Cannon would say, theoethics. Um, and so I began to read those and I'm, what I'm constantly doing is asking myself, how does this translate into the life of the church? How do I take the wisdom that's happening with Henry Giroux or that is happening with, uh, you know, and we've been doing this with Parker Palmer for a good while. Um, but how do you take that and look at it and mine it, mine it, for what it has to say with the church. And it's that translation piece that we're not, I don't know that, that we're not that good at, it's that we haven't had enough practice. And maybe it's that we haven't given people permission to begin to look at it. So in order to, but, but you have to keep in mind that in order to take um, the, you know, something that was written for public education, um, you have to, 
bring your theology to it. Because certainly there is plenty that is written out there that's inconsistent with our theology. So how do we bring these together? And so um, I, you know what, Becky, there's a lot of folks uh, who are, uh, who are looking at yoga and the practices of yoga um, into how uh, that works. So I wanna show you this one slide. Actually, I'm gonna show you two slides and then we're gonna send you to small group. Um, so one of them is, I want you to look here and um, here are just a couple of, here are a few practices. Some of these you're already doing. In fact, some of these the church has always been good at and, and educators have always been good at um, and hopefully pastors have been good at, but it's been easy in our own trauma-informed brain and life and Zoom fatigue to forget to do this. So one, providing content uh, providing the information in advance. Can you do a blog that gives parents the scriptures um, for, for them to be reading with their families before Sunday gets there? Using content descriptions, um, watching it for triggering media. Never, ever, ever, you know this, ever. Show a video clip that you haven't watched first. Creating safe space, checking in on students. Um, as frustrated as I am with the postal service these days, being able to send our, our families, our children, our youth, our adults notes. Um, Fostering a sense of belonging really begins to calm down that, uh, that uh, survival brain. Um, providing flexibility in assessment. I get so tickled. People say to me, um, how, how many pages does that assignment need to be? And any student who's ever had me and asked that question will know I say, as, as many as it takes. You have to decide what that is. Um, when's it due? Um, well, when realistically do you think it will work in your, in your world? Now that's not to say you just throw all accountability out the window, uh, but we begin to uh, rethink that. So here's the last uh, slide that I want you to look at. This is Serene Jones's. Theology is the place where the story you think of, it's that place, it's that story that when asked about, or when you're pondering the meaning of life, what's going on in the world, and where is God in the midst of that, that's theology. Uh, I'm gonna hit that. I want you just to raise your hand if you've ever thoughts about the meaning of life, what's happening in the world, and where is God in the midst of that? Just let me see your hands. I got two hands up for some. You are a theologian. You are doing theology. Um, and that's the question that we must ask ourselves as we take all of this brain research, as we take all of this CDC stuff, and figure out how do we turn it into practice? How do we make this work in our churches? We don't have absence policies, but we should be paying attention to who's showing up and who isn't, because one of the uh, one of the fallouts, one of the uh, one of the things that happens with trauma, is that we check out. And what we know is, as Maya Angelou would say, when we can't remember our own song, we need someone to sing it to us. When we need that, uh, when we need that memory part of our brain reactivated, reinvigorated, well, 
we need somebody to say the 23rd Psalm with us. So we're gonna send you into groups for 15 minutes, 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, I want you to come up with a minimum of three trauma-informed educational practices, three trauma-informed educational practices that would create the space in the midst of a trauma-experienced people to help them nurture faith, to help them grow in the life of faith. Three, got it? When you come back, um, oh, hello, Aaron. Um, uh, when you come back, I want to I want to see those three in uh, in the chat. Okay. Now, in the meantime, if you have questions, put those in chat, and when we come back, we'll see what's going on. See you in fifteen minutes. Yes, I will do that. I think I can broadcast. Actually, I'll have to have Mary Todd do that. So I'm trying to figure out a way um, how to get our Spanish speaker out of her. Okay, you should be able to go. Um, you should be able to pull it. Or is uh, is she? Has, did she say yes and go into the group? She did. Okay, so what you should be able to do is find her name and reassign her. So what group are we? Uh, we are a no group. Okay, so I don't know how to move her to our group. Okay, uh, why don't you create a new group room? Oh, um, okay. And then put the um, uh, put some folks who are in this room okay, that I'm seeing right now. Put them and the interpreters in our. If I can uh, interrupt, uh, we would yeah. like that not to happen because okay. we're trying to record the interpreted versions Got it. and that can only happen in the main room as soon as they go into a breakout that is no longer able to be recorded super thank you so much that's so helpful okay all so right she, so she did not join the group so she must mm, right and those uh, of you who she are is back in the main room now i'm seeing okay. okay thank you all right those of you who are in this room uh, who didn't accept your uh, invitation to join a group, you get to be in a group with um, the folks who are uh, using the interpretation, the interpreter services. And the only one I can tell if they're really here is Ken McFadden, because I can see his face. So Becky, what's the um, prompt? that they're talking about. All right, so you ready to type? Yes. All right, based on what we now know about trauma and pedagogical practices. <laughs> okay, you know sorry. I do not how to spell that word. All right, okay, sorry. Uh, based on what we now know about trauma and the ways in which we need to educate. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, name three ways that you can teach in new ways in your context of ministry.
I'm very well. I can hear you. I can't see you. Okay. All right. She's in this main room, right? Uh, that you're in right now. I, and I apologize about that. I, I was trying to do too many things at one time. All right. Becky, maybe um, you and Ken and Robert and I and Magd Magdalia can answer the questions. Okay. Because it's not clear to me that anybody else um, is, one? is going to their room. Hey, Ken. Hello, uh, Mary Todd. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm well. I really missed the Mid-Atlantic Regional Gathering last night. Uh, Becky Davis and I were in a committee meeting until, what time was that? About 6.20 last night? Uh, yes, but guess who went on to that meeting? Good and who for didn't? you. Good for you. <laughs> That's only because that um, uh, Rinda had asked me to do the closing prayer. Right. <laughs> so... I, I did, but I was a little tired after that. I bet you were. I was tired yeah. after that too, um, and hungry. So yeah, there was that. There Apologies was that. to you, Mary Todd. No yeah. worries at all. We got a new connector, um, Karen right. Miller. So that's exciting. And, and where's uh, Karen located? She's in Chapel Hill, uh, right. Church of the Wreck. Okay, excellent. Yeah. So uh, we're supposed to respond to these questions. Yes, Amira is um, Mizella here. Uh, and ready to participate or break down. Okay. All right. So as you're thinking in terms of teaching in whatever your context is, how might you teach differently um, based on um, what we know about trauma and how it affects the brain and how we learn. I would, uh, I would like to imagine uh, learners um, thinking about how to do a form of journaling that creates safety, mm -hmm. but also the ability to speak or move or feel what they would want to journal, whether that would be with a pen in hand or through keystrokes or through prayer or through whatever means mm -hmm. or singing in the car, but somehow where they would be able to have time they would need in safe space to begin to give words or thoughts or feelings or something in a way that they would want to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Thanks, Ken. Nancy, what are you thinking? You're on mute. Unmute. Sorry. Um, I had to pop inside to handle a little family crisis. I, I, I apologize. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I missed what you were beginning with. We were talking about um, trauma and how trauma in, uh, affects the brain and our ability uh, to learn and our openness to learn um, and thinking about what are some different ways that we can uh, either create space or different strategies, educational strategies that we can use. Mm -hmm. We'll give you some time to think. Thank you. Right on, the, right on the spot. Mary Todd, what are you thinking? 
So in thinking about being online and Zoom, that that's the hard part. Um, I'm thinking about the children that I work with and um, I see them once a week in Sunday school and try to create a space that is safe, but it's not very interactive mm -hmm. at this point. Um, but I do greet them by name when they log on. And if we have time, I, I do um, ask them questions. Um, but I, I struggle with it, Becky, because I, you know, for me, hands-on being face-to-face, -face, eyeball to eyeball, being able to offer that welcome when they come to church, um, it's tough because I know we're all traumatized by this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, it affects us as teachers and our ability to be creative every bit as much as it affects the students and the participants that we walk with. Mm -hmm. I will say, uh, uh, Becky, uh, um, that Allison and Kelly, uh, my CDC and uh, the assistant program director have done a fabulous job with trying to be creative and coming up with spaces and activities that they can release some of that within. Mm -hmm. And um, it started out with the driveway drop-ins, <laughs> mask up, go visit, play in the backyard, one-on-one -on -one stuff um, with the Justice Seekers group, which is our fourth and fifth graders, they meet in parks, um, but they distance and their activities do that to get some of that energy out and um, where they can have those conversations in a safe space too. Mm -hmm. you know, Good. They get dropped off. And so that without, you know, the parents are usually off by themselves and uh, and, and then they can have that freedom to, to just let it out. Mm -hmm. Good, good, that's great, Nancy. Do I hear that your retirement is approaching? Who knows? <laughs> have you been talking with God? It may be. Now, I'm, I'm just kind of, my husband's in a, a precarious health situation, so I don't do a lot of the, I do some one-on-one -on -one with masks, but I don't do a lot of that. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Um, Amira, Amara, sorry, do not need, mean to butcher your name. Uh, is our, I want to make sure that we're not talking over top of um, our sibling who might want to offer something. Right. Thank you. No, estoy escuchándolo. Estoy atenta. Gracias. Rebecca, it's, it's okay. I understand and may, may, not all the time, but the most important part of the conference, I understand. <laughs> but I I use the, the interpretation. Great. Okay. <laughs> I was, yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, I I could hear her. Thank you. <laughs> Gracias. All right. So Ken, I'm curious, do you see a difference um, 
in what what's happening in classrooms and um, with students at the seminary uh, during this kind of trauma, post trauma um, time? Or is it kind of this is just what this is normal? I do think there's an accumulative effect. And so in your one of your slides, it had a kind of definition of an event or a series of events. I think that COVID-19 and the world uh, with various protests and um, violence in the Capitol and everything else we've experienced, there's just a layering and accumulative effect that is that different people are experiencing differently. I mean, in the ways you're talking about how different people interpret and experience some events more traumatically than others and some not at all. So I think there's a real buildup there Mm -hmm. um, that that I see, um, and there's just a there's just a, a weariness um, that I see. I mean, I, I do think sometimes we talk about Zoom fatigue or certainly people burning out, whether they're in seminaries or churches or nonprofits or wherever. But I just think there's just a, there's an energy drain. Yes, um, and it's just hard to find where to uh, find new energy, even though uh, we have hope with things like. Mm -hmm vaccines and justice making initiatives and activities, uh, there's still a lot of depletion. And so I wonder how we counter the depletion and it won't happen through two shots in the arm or you know one good event. It's gonna it's gonna take time to build build back up the the strength that we have had in the past. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You have captured some of what um, we'll talk about as we move into these final few minutes. Um, it's because I listen to you every chance I can. Oh, oh, Ken, so not true. True. <laughs> uh, don't be fooled. Oh, I don't flatter. You are too, well, we have that. I do not flatter. <laughs> oh, look at what's coming back. I love Holly. What a great question. How will we mark the anniversary of the shutdown? We mark the anniversaries of 9-11. We mark the anniversaries of, you know, any number of things. But how will we mark the anniversary of the shutdown? Nice. Use small group discussions. People feel safer sharing in smaller groups. Yep. Open space for youth to come and just be. I love um, at the seminary uh, in, in Richmond, the instructional um, uh, resource person has virtual office hours where people can just drop in, um, which I just think is fabulous. So then it's on the student's time um, and not on our time. Shared leadership, absolutely. What would it be like to work um, to invite some of our students, even our children. So let's not think that this only works with you, but well, how might we invite our children during the week to help us prepare and thus then lead part of what we're going to do on uh, Sunday or Wednesday or Tuesday or whenever we do uh, we do our, our uh, time with intentional development of faith. Uh, yes, connecting with members of the group, remember belonging. This is a perfect time for us to be remembering our baptism. Those of you who know me know that I'm gonna work in baptism any chance I get. So what, you know, part of that telling of that story, that's what the psalmist is doing, is rehearsing the story of who they are and who God is, and who they are in relationship to God and God to them. So let us remember our baptism. Um, and Sarah Kate, I want to see pictures of Liddy's baptism at some point. I actually want to see Liddy sometime. Um, see, uh, the session is scheduled to end in five minutes. Yeah, I know. I know, this just makes me so sad. That wasn't from a participant. That was from GNTV. Ha! Uh, keeping us on track. Witnessing. Oh, Aaron, this is fabulous. Witnessing, not trying to fix things. 
that is marvelous, marvelous. The other things I've been playing around with, and um, if you don't know, I mean, there's some great educational technologies out there that are so easy to use and so free, and you can uh, put them in there. And um, I will make a note to give you access to my Wakelet. If you don't know Wakelet, you must know Wakelet um, that has different teaching technologies that I use um, that you can use. What if you started, if, 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 if you're, let's say, let's just say you do it on Sunday morning. What if that was the beginning and that all week there were things that, that families and that uh, small pods of, of students, cohorts of students could be working on throughout the week so that it is self-paced, so that it is, uh, they get some choice and some freedom about how they do it. It's their safety because it's people that they feel comfortable with. Um, let me ask GNTV if uh, when we shut this down, normally it downloads to my computer so that I get to save chat. Who gets the copy of the chat um, in this? Mary Todd, can you find that out for me? Because what I'd love to do is take what's in this chat and put it into a, a wonderful list so that you all can have this wealth of ideas. Well, you, um, could do, you, could, you could cut and paste it into a document if, if it doesn't save the chat separately. Okay. Um, I'm just so used to it saving chat uh, directly, but now I see that I can save the chat right here. Um, so it says chat saved, show and ponder. You know, look. No, I can turn off the video. What? All right, I can't see. I sounded like somebody was going to say something. Um, I want you all to hear. I want you to see. I want you to recognize the incredible giftedness that you've already been given in order to do educational ministry in the ways in which we must do it. Uh, given that we're all experiencing trauma, that our bodies are holding within us these responses uh, to long ongoing trauma. Uh, it, it will uh, limit our capacity to be creative. It will limit our patience, yes, with one another, but also with ourselves. So how do we create space in our lives as educators that nurture us, that create within us the ability to uh, continue to be patient, to be creative, to be loving, to be pastoral, to be caring, uh, to come up with new ways of teaching. So this is as much about, you know, the, here's a list of things you need to do as it is about how do you tend and care to your own soul by that, uh, by that river, by that, in that green pasture, in that place where you can remember who you are that you're not any place that God hasn't already been. And you're not in any place where God already isn't there. So take deep breaths. Find a way to refresh your memory. Is it reading scripture? Is it singing? You're singing someone else's song to them as they sing their song back to you. We all are experiencing trauma our students, our families, and yes, us. But what we know about trauma is we must work through it together. So tomorrow, we're going to look at some uh, strategies, particular um, to how do we educate it in, in complex and, 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 and ambiguous and uncertain times. Um, and so I look forward to seeing you tomorrow uh, and at 1.30. So we will uh, we'll start at 1.30. We'll be finished by 2.30 because I have another teaching date at 2.30.
Um, and I look forward to seeing all of you and I'm gonna do my best to get this in a list for you um, so I can put it in the chat tomorrow. And I put the lament in the chat. Go in peace. We'll see you tomorrow.